Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of Streaming with the Devs. I am, unfortunately, your host, Steven, also known as slave to machine coming to you on our Twitch channel for OP Noobs Online. And today, I am very, 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 very pleased, uh, not counting the Lannister banner ahead of me, I am very pleased to talk to the folks behind Crowfall. Huge, huge game. I get a chance to talk to Gordon Walton and J. Todd Coleman. So... I'm not going to bother saying anything. I'm going to let them tell you who they are and why they are so important. So please, folks, Gordon, you have a heck of a pedigree. Tell us about some of the games that you've worked on, all of which I have played, come to think of it. <laughs> I don't think you played all of them. No, no, no. So that's a list as much Many of them. as you're probably looking at, yeah. You'd be surprised, uh, but go ahead. I've been fortunate enough to work on a bunch of uh, fairly major MMOs. Uh, particularly Star Wars The Old Republic, Star Wars Galaxies, uh, Ultima Online, The Sims Online. I did a little stint on that planet side once upon a time. And a bunch of uh, MMOs that came before that, before there was uh, before there was an Ultima Online. I worked on Air Warrior and Legends of Esmai and a lot of early MMOs that were done on the online services. And before that, I made standalone games for many years. And Mr. Coleman? Yeah, so I, I, I don't have the benefit of saying I did a lot of standalone games. I've, in fact, only done online games. I'm an old-school mud guy. I started uh, on Daiku Muds back uh, when Daiku Muds were, I guess, the, the most cutting edge of online games. Uh, I did a game after that called Shadowbane, where I was creative director and one of the founders of that studio. Uh, we sold that to Ubisoft, and I was the creative director then on a game called Wizard 101, which is the biggest game that most gamers have never heard of. We had 50 million players um, uh, in the U.S., uh, in primarily in the 8 to 12 age group, but a, a lot of parents as well. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I had a stint uh, doing um, family-friendly uh, MMOs, mm -hmm. and now I'm back to take another swing at, at PvP, because um, I feel like I have unfinished business in that area. So before we get into Crowfall, because I think just about everybody has heard about Crowfall, it was a massive success on Kickstarter, and it's even now still taking in donations on the site. We'll get to that in a minute, but I, I'm curious about the pedigree. I'm curious, first off, MMOs are generally accepted to be a very difficult game to produce, uh, to code, to upkeep. Why MMOs? Uh, that, that's part of the reason. Why not? Yeah. It's hard. That's, yeah. That makes it awesome to do. So, yeah. it's, so it's just because it's a huge. Is it just because it's a, a huge undertaking? Well, I think it's because of the. For me, it's of the effect that we have on our players. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting life share, not mind share, out of people, and you know, we're creating universes that they get to really expend a lot of time and energy in, where they, you know, it becomes a big part of their life. And so the amount of effort you have to do to get there is just paying the toll to do that, you know, to have that effect with people. And for me, it's I've always done online, like I said. I mean, that's, that's kind of all, all I know how to do, quite frankly. Um, you know, I, even from a playing standpoint, to me, having other players in the game with you adds, uh, that's the magical component, right, that, that, that makes the, the game, it breathes life into the universe. So without that, you know, I, other, with a few exceptions, right, like the, the Telltale games, um, generally speaking, the only ones that I really get immersed into are the ones where other players also buy into that same universe. So do you feel, do you feel that it, it gives the players more control of the narrative? They can make their own stories in MMO uh, between players as opposed to just kind of giving them a story and saying, okay, here's the lore, here's the story, go at it? Um, well, it can, right? It, it actually depends. You, we've, we've seen a rec uh, kind of over the last decade, I'd say, we've seen MMOs shift dramatically away from the idea of players controlling the story, uh, World of Warcraft being the obvious, like, king example of that, um, towards the players being placed on rails where they're actually driven through uh, as much of a controlled experience as you can possibly have and having the other players around but um, trying to minimize the impact because, you know, anything that developers can't control uh, has been seen for a while now as bad, especially because it's the enemy of scalability. If you want to hit, you know, a thousand times as big as the previous games, in order to do that, you want to try and control every bit of that user's experience. Um, there's a benefit to that. You know, the scalability is nice, but it also means that a lot of really cool elements 
that used to make these games so magical has been lost. And so that's a big chunk of why, you know, we're taking the direction we are with Crowfall is, is we want to try and recapture that. Okay. So obviously both of you have pretty good pedigrees, like I've said already. Uh, you've worked for some of the, the bigger companies out there. Why go to Kickstarter? Is it, is it that Crowfall would just be too, too much for a traditional publisher? Or what, what was the impetus that kind of pushed you to go indie and go with Kickstarter as a well, I think it's two, it's two major things. The first one is major publishers are risk adverse. Until you prove something is going to work, they're mm -hmm. not going to get that excited because they're not in the risk business. They're in the risk mitigation business. Their job is to say, every dollar we invest, we're going to get another dollar back, which means it's hard for them to say, let's take a flyer on some crazy idea and spend a lot of money to find out if it works or not. So they aren't good targets for games that either would have a smaller audience naturally or just crazy enough to where maybe they won't find an audience at all, which is kind of where we were. The other, the other thing is, you know, we've done it for other companies before, uh, and... Frankly, why should they get all the upside? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I also think that, that if you look at, at publishers in general, right, over the last, uh, there have been an arms race ever since WoW, um, you know, started, showed that there were this, what we all believe was the ceiling before, right, which was maybe a half a million subscribers. WoW mm -hmm. blew that out of the water and showed that, that what we thought was the ceiling wasn't really the ceiling at all. And so there became an arms race and the arms race was really centered around how wide and deep can you possibly make these universes because that's the key to real immersion. And so the budgets just skyrocketed to this insane degree. And then all these publishers kind of got burned, right? Chasing after the, the wow, the, you know, the dragon in the forest, trying to defeat it and out wow, wow, which is very hard when you have a game that's generating that much money because they're reinvesting a lot of that money into the game. So you're actually not competing with wow at launch. You're competing with wow every month plus one all right so if you think about that as a challenge it means you're trying to hit a moving target that's gaining mass like a big katamari damasi ball right it's just every every moment every tick of the clock it's getting that much bigger and harder for you to take it on so um so i i think that a, a few of the publishers placed major major bets in this arena and those bets uh they, they weren't complete failures generally but they certainly didn't pay off or have the roi they expected and so there there was kind of a mass retreating from the space in fact if you go to a site like mmorpg.com right now and look at the most anticipated list of upcoming games you know we're one of them but the more important and more interesting note to me is that all of the top 10 are from indie Indie-ish. I hate to use that term. It feels unfair to actual indies when guys mm -hmm. like us use the term. But independent, independent yeah. studios like it's it's games like you know Pantheon and Dar and Camelot Unchained and Shroud of the Avatar and Us. Uh, so it, it's it's interesting because it's kind of like that cleared the runway for the guys who originally were willing to experiment in the space, guys like us, to come back and experiment in the space again. And Kickstarter gave us a way to actually do that without having to risk taking money from somebody who could then use the golden rule, he who has the gold rules, to say, no, 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 you need to make this game wow, because that's what we want is another wow. And the best way to potentially build another wow is to rebuild wow. And I think, I, I think that's one of the things that have happened in the past couple of years. I mean, we if you check the gaming press, Every time an MMO comes out, you're going to invariably hear somebody say the phrase "Wow Killer," and that obviously has not happened. Uh, in fact, there are a number of games that uh, that uh, you yourself, Mr. Gordon, have worked on that some of them have kind of gone that gamut, and it didn't. Yeah, he, he quite never work wanted out. to say that. I don't think. No. <laughs> uh, every time somebody says that, you cringe. Yeah. Because it's foolish, right? Well, e even Blizzard, right, has been scared, or I, from what I know, I don't know, I don't work there, but yeah. they seem hesitant to try and produce another MMO because it's competing with WoW. I mean, it's 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 hard when you have a situation like that for anybody to think they can recapture lightning in the bottle. And when the bets are hundred million dollar plus development cost bets, that's a pretty small number of people who are willing to step up to that table. So this is the last bit I'm going to ask about WoW or other MMOs before we get into Crowfall, because that's really what I want to get into. What is it that 
that Blizzard is doing that is keeping people coming back? Is it just the longevity aspect? Is it that people are familiar with it? What is it that Blizzard is doing with their game that others have, have tried to replicate and haven't done so well with? Well, we'll probably have different answers, but for me, it's one, they did a fabulous job. Mm. You know, if, yeah. I mean, the first time I, the game. first time I played WoW in beta, you know, I just was blown away about how well crafted the game was, mm -hmm. and of course, it's only gotten better since then. That's that's first and foremost. The second thing is, when you compare it, so when you do such a good job, and you play other things, it becomes your home because you go, everything else isn't quite as well put together, so people keep going back to WoW because there is no alternative for them, mm -hmm. for that kind of experience. There's a temporary alternatives. They go and try stuff, and then they get far enough in the experience where it's not quite as well crafted and put together. Like, I remember playing Conan, for example, right? And Conan, the first 20-ish levels were awesome. I was going, wow, I'm having a great time. This is super. And then it suddenly fell apart, right? It just, yeah. suddenly it was like, oh, you left me, you took me on this great date. We're all excited, and all of a sudden you just left me there. You know, in, in the wrong place. And what did I do? I went back and started playing WoW again. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that same pattern because there just isn't an alternative, and they and they've come to find that's their home. Yeah, my my answer is actually pretty similar to mm -hmm. to your second half, which is that inherently, at the end of the day, um, we're we're herd animals, like <laughs> humans. We all want to go where everybody else is, generally, or we want to pick the spot everybody else isn't, and then we all want to go there. Like we, that's why things we just tend to polarize, right? We're either Coke people or we're Pepsi people. Like, and so I think that you know, for the longest time, WoW was just the place where everybody was, and we all want to go where everybody knows our name. So they have so much mass at this point that yes, I mean it, that that the experience is what got people in originally, but what kept them there was the other people. I, I think I think that that community, you know, that you are you don't want to go. I mean, it's it's quite frankly the same reason that Facebook is so hard for anybody to displace because do I really want to go through the process of setting that whole community up again? No, I don't. I mean, technically those are, it's not really Facebook's IP that's pulling me back. Those are my friends. Those are my family members, right? But the fact is I've already got all those connections made and I'm already into the habit of doing it. So I go back. Same kind uh, of thing. I, I don't think we want to even go into Google plus, but that's a whole other, whole other uh, ball of wax. So Crowfall, it, it seems like this weird combination of MMO and RTS, which I, I really like. I've been a big fan of RTSs for many, 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 many years. Uh, it, is that a fair designation for it, kind um, of the combination? I don't, I, don't, I don't think I'd necessarily say it's an R RTS. I'd say definitely strategy game, yeah. but um, it's actually more similar to like Civilization or something right. like that, I think. Um, RTS to me implies that I am controlling a whole bunch of little units in real time, and you're really not doing that. Though Civilization, you're also controlling a bunch of units, so that's probably not a great example either, because um, you're playing the little units, right? So right. I don't know that there's a great analogy for it. It, it is largely an MMORPG, but because we've taken a few elements from strategy games, the biggest of those being resources and time allocation and a win condition at the end, mm -hmm. um, it does, I think, make it a different animal. Um, and as a result of it being a different animal, that means there's not really a good... Uh, phrase or word for it yet, right? That's why we, we sat around talking about this for a long time. Like, how do we define this thing? Once we explain it, uh, people are like, oh, I get that, but there wasn't mm -hmm. a good word. So that's why we came up with the term Throne War Simulator. Right. Um, but I don't know, eventually, maybe maybe the industry will come up with a better term than we did. I don't know. Oh, the players will. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. I Well, it is a hybrid. In fact, uh, on the site is billed as the my favorite sentence that's ever been written is it the unholy child between Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, and EVE Online. <laughs> How in the world do you take those three elements and, and compress them? How does Crowfall meet each of those kind of descriptors? Yeah, so the, the fact that it has three parents, that's what makes it an unholy love child, right? That's where the right. unholy part comes in. Yeah. So um, it, really, it, it really narratively and design-wise, it draws elements from all of those, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, of the list of three, Eve is the persistent world universe, right? And that really talks to the game at the macro level. It's not a direct correlation at all. The problem is, again, there's no obvious direct correlation, so it's kind of like, well, we know this isn't precise, 
but I guess it's the best we got, so we'll try and, and, and include that in the in the stew. But with Eve, the open world PvP, the the harsh universe, the you know letting the players do all the emergent behavior, we you know that's yeah that's, that's the piece that we're hitting. That's why it's apparent. Yeah, that's the piece we're hitting. Where but we, where we don't have is I don't believe that we're going to have the depth of like um, uh, statistical ma management that that Eve has. I mean that there's there's a lot of gameplay there that revolves around math and stuff like that. That's much more hardcore than I think well, like players like me. I, I I'm not going to get that quite down and deep into it. But I do like. The, the, the meta game level I think is really cool. Um, the Game of Thrones is is obvious from a narrative blend, right? The the obvious uh, connection we did it with gods instead of houses because we liked the idea of immortals that cross world to world to world uh, to world. But um, but the idea of, of having it be faction based or having it be team based and having it be these large political structures that are tied to the terrain and at the end of the day having the impact of okay well we lost this siege. Therefore, we lost this entire campaign. That was the kind of feeling that we wanted there. Walking Dead was really more about the survival aspect, yeah. right? Is we wanted to create. That's why we created the idea of the hunger as a narrative concept. The idea of this corruption that's spreading world to world. It gave us a nice wrapper for why why these worlds are ending or why these campaigns come to an end. Mm -hmm. But it also just raised the general threat level, like the general adrenaline level of the universe. Uh, to have that feeling of survival, like I could turn a corner and I could find myself surrounded by um, ten enemies and I'm toast. You know, we, we wanted that general feeling. Or I stumble into a house and I open up a chest and I find a weapon that's actually going to make me survive for another three hours. That's really cool. So those are those are kind of the different gameplay and narrative elements that we were trying to bring together. So so at at the end of the day, it is kind of it's not just about survival, but it is also about working together. Uh, obviously, this is not a game that you can really solo? Or is there a possibility of, of being able to strike out on your own? You can certainly solo. It's a question of goal, right? If, if, you're, if you want to achieve personal goals, then you can absolutely do that personally. But if you want to achieve the goal of my team's going to rule the universe or my team's going to win this campaign, then no, you probably can't do that on your own. You can't, you can't take the team goals and achieve those individually. But you probably could make a pretty significant difference individually or with a small group of people. And, and even though it is survival, which feels very individual uh, oriented, you know, or, or feels like it has that kind of individual feeling, even Walking Dead, if you look at it, really is about that group, which changes and constantly morphs as they add and remove people. But True. it still is about the group dynamic um, and group survival. So at, at, at the end of it, I mean, again, with many MMOs, you can go at it alone, but to do major, major stuff, you do have to group up. You need to be social. God forbid someone be social in an MMO with other <laughs> players. Uh, wow. I know I'm, I'm guilty of it. I will often solo content up to a certain point, and then I'll decide, okay, th I can't handle this stuff on my own. I need to group up with people. So, again, a lot of times the mechanic has to go toward that social aspect. Is that... that that about fair? Well, we're, we're building the game with different mechanics at different levels, right? We have individual level things that you can do, like personal crafting, and I need to go kill this monster for some particular reason. I want to build my house. Mm -hmm. Then there's a whole bunch of kind of guild team faction related goals, and those you really do need more people um, to be able to, uh, to, to achieve those goals. And so from, from everything that I've read and everything that I've watched and everything that I've heard, the seasons. How are how are the seasons measured? Are they are they real time? Is it in game time? I I've never really been. It, it totally is in game. What is it is real time in reflected in game, but it's on a, a faster cycle. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, the the point is to have a full cycle of one year: spring, summer, fall, winter happen within each campaign. Mm -hmm. But that's not supposed to play out over twelve months. It's supposed to play out over a shorter time. The amount of time is actually going to vary. We may have campaigns that will be one month. We may have some that are three. We may have some that are six. My guess is six is going to be too long, and then we're going to see that the sweet spot is probably six-week, two-month, three-month campaigns. But that's something that, uh, you know, the nice thing about being able to have these campaigns be self-contained and have a begin, middle, and end is at the end, we can actually shut it down, learn from it, and prop new campaigns where we make different choices. I mean, that, that's what I really love about our design architecture is that we have the ability to constantly change and keep the game fresh, which is really cool. So what, what exactly happens at the end of a season? The world's reset, the, ma the maps, quote-unquote, reset. 
Uh, the but map's the actually technically map. blown away. It doesn't just reset. Like, that yeah. world's eaten, and that map right. is going to be lost. If you go into a new campaign, it's a new world map that may be bigger, it may be smaller, it's going to be covered in fog of war. All of the POIs and the strategic resources and the old abandoned castles and stuff will be in different locations. Mm -hmm. So the, the game itself, just like the game is broken up into seasons, the gameplay experience is going to be broken up into stages, which if, that's why I drew the the connection to, to Civ earlier, because if you think about civilization, when you first come in with that first settler unit versus at the end when you have all your railroads built up and you're whipping stuff around, they're very different games based mm -hmm. on the same foundation. So we want that same kind of feel. So this is, this is starting to me, it, it sounds like it's a good deal of a combination, like you said, civilization and an MMO. So yep. it's, it's just a, not just, I don't want to say that, but it's a multiplayer MMO. A, a multiplayer, mass, massively multiplayer MMO. <laughs> it, it's 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 really difficult because we you know we as gamers and gaming press and everybody else we always want a specific you know acronym to attach to everything. That's and right. Crowfall, Crowfall just does not meet any of those. Well, and that that's the way it always is when somebody tries something new. I mean, MOBA yeah. didn't exist right ten years right. ago until somebody had this clever idea and put the pieces together and said, hey, let's try this. This might be fun and it turns out they were right. It was amazingly fun, and it took off from there, and now there's a whole genre. So with, with the characters, though, uh, the worlds get wiped away. Yep. But the characters, by and large, stay the same. Do they carry over? They, the characters do carry over. Okay. The amount of equipment and loot you're able to take off of that campaign world back out into the universe as a whole, though, depends on how well your team or faction did in the campaign. So that actually gives you a driver to care about how well the campaign goes is, you know, to the victor goes the spoils. Right. So if things go terribly, you'll basically be starting, you, you won't really be able to carry much over, but if that, things go absolutely well. That's the general rule, yeah. In actuality, it depends on, on the type of campaign world. But, but the general rule is you want to win the campaign because you want the, the loot. You want more loot. And not just the loot. Oh, yeah. Right? bragging rights and you want the leaderboard and you I mean there, there's other reasons to, to that drive people to want to win as well other than just persistence and, and loot but that's a big one I don't, I don't know for some reason the 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 idea of a CrossFit MMO is kind of how this is coming about so <laughs> you you see all the other people that you're that you're playing with you want to be better than the next guy so it's a very very competitive nature from from everything that I'm hearing I I'm a fan of this so basically you can't really coast if you want to be able to really, really seriously enjoy the game, it's not, you have to work toward the end goal. Well, you you should, and and the key of working toward right is we've also changed that we we removed PVE monster killing as the primary mechanism of advancement because it, we we felt that was becoming more of a chore. Right? It was that was fun at first when none of us had played MMOs. We've all kind of done that for thousands of hours now so it doesn't seem to have the luster that it once did so we just we just removed it we said okay they're going to be monsters the monsters are there though to increase the threat level of the universe and to provide some material some reagent gathering but they're not you don't have to go let's go to this camp and we're going to farm this monster for three hours to gain a level instead we made it all passive uh, timer based also because that meant the people that didn't have as much time to play the game could still get in and be competitive you know, even if I can only check in, uh, you know, for 15 minutes every night and then play on the weekends and Gordon can play for four hours a day, uh, the weekend comes, we can still compete with each other and he's not off to this, you know, ridiculous start. In fact, in most MMOs, it's an unattainable difference in level, right? If he's 30th level and I'm 20th and we PvP, he'll kill me a thousand times and I won't even uh, hurt him once. So, um, so we're eliminating that. Just a different right. goal, you know, for our game design. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the disconnects with MMOs is it, it's presumed that unless you have copious amounts of free time, you're, you're really never going to enjoy the game. And at the same time, you're paying $15, $20 a month for this game that you're probably not playing more than a few hours a week or depending on your schedule. Now, that was the other thing. I noticed that the game, once you buy it, it's yours. There, there's no subscription, nothing like that. What, what were the, the decisions behind that? Out of curiosity, uh, you know, I think that we're players too, and you know, we we look at, you know, what's the value proposition for a player, and you know, the onus is on us in this world, you know. So we could have gone free to play. There's a lot of reasons to go free to play, but in the end, we said, hey, we're going to provide something of value to people, 
If they value it, they'll buy it. If they like any of the other stuff that we're selling, if they want to get a subscription or they want to buy stuff in game, more power to them. But we should have a good value for value relationship with our consumers. And we love the Guild Wars model. You know, buy it once and play it forever. Yeah. Also, if you think about it, when you have a game that's not based on linear content, it's mm -hmm. based on the actions of other players. There, you have a really strong reason to want people to keep playing, right? And having to pay every month by, you know, mandatorily is kind of a disincentive for people playing. If they can buy it once and then play it forever, not only are they going to enjoy it themselves, but they'll also be in there providing content in a very real way to your other players. So we thought with this particular game design, it made a lot of sense. So with the game design, actually that leads into my next question is, so the community itself is basically helping everybody else play the game. They're creating content. They're creating in-game items. How much, uh, how much has the community and the forums and whatnot, how much has that lent toward the, the creation of the game? Have there been any major, major suggestions in the forums that have made its way into the game? Yeah, is there a balance yeah, there, on that? There, uh, there have been a few. In fact, there have even been a few on the narrative side that they were like, ooh, that's a really good idea. I think we should probably try and work that in. But we, um, it would be hard to even just pick one because we are constantly on our forums. Like on a daily basis, yeah. we're, we're in our forums. Where I think people, if they aren't actually, you know, uh, uh, you know like a, a hardcore fan, if they're more casually watching us, they probably don't recognize how much... Uh, communication we have with our fan base like it's it's staggering <laughs> well it's like a live game yeah we yeah we're treating it like it's a live mmo i think we do updates on tuesdays and thursday where, where we do some significant updates about the game and then on wednesdays at least every other wednesday if not more um usually you i, I mean i'll occasionally will jump in but usually gordon jumps in to give a state of the nation about the uh, about the company itself and how the project's doing more of a business Let's talk about the business of making these things uh, update. And have have you found that people are are more receptive to as as you can tell from many of the questions that I've been asking, uh, our focus or at least our audience is is primarily made up of indie devs or or people that want to get into game design or want to get into development and they're just really not sure how they they might think that they need copious amounts of years of experience, you know, slogging away for 20, 30 years before they can make a game. But now with the, the, with Kickstarter and Indiegogo and all those other crowdfunding platforms with Unity Engine and Unreal and all that being released to the public, people can now start making games of, of their own. And so do you feel that you get better responses from community questions about the development or the in-game lore, the in-game features? Well, we don't we don't get a lot of business like ideas pitched yeah. to us. I mean, for the most part, the feedback that we get is is internals about the game design or the narrative or yeah. whatever. Not I don't. There are very few people that weigh in or like. Have you considered being a C corp and in, in <laughs> Delaware? Certain tax advantages that doesn't really come up um, very often. Though we have had a few, right? Yeah. So um, and not much about the real development. It's really I mean, what players are interested in is what the experience is going to be. Because right. right now it's still, you know, a little bit of a Rorschach test, right? We've given them lots of outlines of what we're building, mm -hmm. but you know, players love the details, and the details come at the very end. Yeah, that's unfortunately that's the tuning case. and, right. you know, <laughs> and tuning happens at the very end where you go, okay, this is the number for this thing. Doesn't happen until very, very late in the process. The broad brush strokes happen much early, mm -hmm. earlier. So with with Crowfall, it doesn't sound like is there any possibility or even a, a purpose to say it, the traditional expansion pack? Because Crowfall itself sounds like it's always going to be growing and changing. Would there even be a purpose for that, other yeah, than just regular maybe. patches? Yeah, maybe I don't know. We've we've talked about what would that be, right? In fact, in fact, some of our users had a big conversation about what would that be, and I found it fascinating to listen to them talk because it's like you know it's happy. I'm glad to sit back and just let them riff on this a little bit. So there's a couple ideas of things that we could do that actually seem like they would be large enough and interesting enough that they would drive people to go, hey, yeah, I'd, I'd be willing to try that. But you're right. I mean, our, our, our baseline goal is to keep the game constantly fresh mm -hmm. so that, I mean, and that does kind of, you know, to some degree mean that we don't need expansion packs as much. Um, so I don't know. We'll, we'll, I guess, partially I feel like we need to 
continue pushing forward, make the best game we can, get it at a launch and see what kind of community we have. And from there, determine, OK, we have all these different ideas for how we thought we would grow this. Now let's start to solidify that down. Every MMO I've ever launched, I mean, you may go into it they believing you understand what your expansion plan is going to be. But almost all that stuff's done more tactically yeah. after launch, where you look at it and you go, "Oh, now we're getting real feedback from people." Here's, you know, here's what's going on with with that. So now we're going to change our plan and and do the expansion that the players want, yeah. not that we want. So yeah, and and sometimes that means, oh yeah, that they don't really want an expansion. They want us to fix the game that we have to be one way or the other, right? I've seen all different types of things. Happen. Yeah, I think a lot of times people also have a, a, a mistaken understanding if they haven't been through game development of what the actual process is like. Like, there is definitely a feeling of when you start, hey, here's what I want to build. But as you're hacking your way through that jungle, right, you are going to learn things as you go that inevitably change what that is. Well, so I kind of look at it as you march because you have a fundamental belief in there's a great vision over here, but the exact vision is gonna it's gonna reveal itself to you as you do it. It's not um, it's not like you're making accounting software where it's all right. Here's the list of the 1,400 different functions that we have to hit to be legally compliant. One, two, three, four, 1,400. Check it off, ship it off, and that's the product. It just doesn't work that way. You know, as you're doing it, you see interesting new connections. You're like, oh, you know what? This system over here and this system over here. Those would tie together really well. We should totally do that. That's awesome. And I know this piece over here is supposed to connect to this. Well, that doesn't work at all. Wow, we're going to have to figure something else out to wire those pieces together. It's a lot more ex of exploration than I think people realize. It doesn't have to be if you're willing to clone something, right? If your got job is, if your goal is to, hey, this game was really cool. Let's remake that only with different art. Okay, well, that's much more easy. But when you're doing something that hasn't been done before, by definition, there is a huge amount of trial and error and iteration that happens. Um, that, you know, if that, but that said, I, I prefer it. I mean, it's, it is more risky, but it's also way more fun than just checking off a bunch of boxes. Yeah, and that's what I think, that's where I think Crowfall really has it, its focus. And I think that's me personally, the, as soon as I started reading up on Crowfall, I'm like, I'm going to donate to this immediately because cool, it's, it's not something that we've ever really seen before. I mean, we've seen smatterings of it. We've seen game modes in other games with some of these features, but we haven't seen a standalone game with all of this combined. Now, the one thing that I was, the, the thing that actually sold me on it, and this sounds kind of petty, but the use of voxels, the destruction, the be, being able to destroy just about anything in the world. Why is that not being done more in games? <laughs> really, really hard, really hard is, yeah. is why. It, it's one of those things that you put in, and it's kind of a chaos factor. Like, you don't know what other assumptions that you had are now going to be broken as a result of doing it. So, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's again, it's about risk mitigation. We picked a couple areas that were extremely risky one of which i actually feel pretty good about now which you know our biggest risk going into this even as risky as voxels is i thought our biggest risk is would people accept the idea of the campaign world being destroyed at the end because mm -hmm. in fact some very very smart people told us no they won't like that's what you're mm -hmm. selling with an mmo is you're selling the persistence of the world and we we thought okay that that's partially true but we felt like you were more buying the persistence of your character and the interaction with all of the other players. And we thought that at least some portion of the existing MMO market would be interested in trying a game like this out. And that was the big bet going to Kickstarter. And, and it looks like, you know, knock on wood, it looks like we were right about that, that we would get at least enough to, to be able to build this game and try it. I, I would certainly say so. So Kickstarter, uh, 1.7 million, if I, if I recall. And yeah. then over 300,000 just straight from the site. I unfortunately got, didn't get a chance to donate during the Kickstarter, but like I said, I did on the site. So how long was this idea in germination before you went to Kickstarter with it? Well, okay, so the you idea got, has uh, been in germination for a while. Well, yeah, so um, a lot of these ideas were ideas that kind of rolled out of the first game I was creative director on, which was a game called Shadowbane back in 2003, 2000, yeah, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then I started, I think we started that one in 1999. So some of those ideas have been around for a long time. The actual uh, packaging and wrapping of that into something that became Crowfall wasn't until, um, I guess, two years ago 20, after I left. 2013. Yeah, after I left Kings Isle. Um, and we, we actually had a, you know, a couple different ideas that we pitched around, but this was the one that, uh, that we talked about, that Gordon and I talked, talked through. And I, this is the one that I really, really wanted to do because I, I felt like this was an area of design space that um, you know, we, we tried with Shadowbane, me, me and, and uh, some great guys that I used to work with that tried, and it didn't, we didn't work, it didn't quite work, right? Like um, some areas worked really well, some things just didn't work at all. And to me, the big piece that was missing from that game was the idea of the resetting campaign worlds. Like that, the idea of having a win state and being able to then wipe the map and have people restart and play another strategy game, that was the piece that I feel like was left out. So um, so I'd always wanted to go back and, and, and retake another swing at that. And when he first described it to me, I think he was expecting me to go, that's a crazy idea, it'll never work. But in fact, you know, way back in the early days before there was an internet MMO market, there were games that reset every month. You yeah. know, that literally had monthly resets. So you'd play the game to a to a win condition and then reset. So it's not it, like every, most things. Every old everything old is new again eventually. And so we're just melding several old things together to make something new, which is hard to describe today. So he went to you with the idea. Thought you were going to say no. What, was there any point in this process where either of you thought we have bitten off way more than we could probably chew? And I think I'm that happens every day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're. Talking. Yeah, that's pretty much every day. We, yeah. we, we were definitely. <laughs> I can tell you the the biggest fear was the the that 24 hour period leading into our Kickstarter, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, you know, we went into it and, and Kickstarter, the nature of it is it's all or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been, we've been working on the, you know, the campaign and the baseline engine and the pre-production art and the website and the video and all that stuff. And it, you know, six months and it felt very much like launching an MMO, right? Because you're building up to this moment of anticipation and, you know, you just don't, we just didn't know if people at the end of the day would buy the idea or not. Um, so that I'd say that was the the biggest moment of fear was that morning. So, Kick, Kickstarter from from all the devs that I've spoken to in the last couple of months, pretty much all of them say the same thing. Kickstarter is wonderful when it works. Kickstarter has this this thing about it, where walking into it, you never know what's going to happen. You don't know how people are going to respond to it, if anybody's going to pick up on it. But obviously to the tune of 1.7 million, obviously there's enough people out there that thought this was a fantastic idea. I'm personally one of them. I know you probably can't name any names and I don't want to draw anybody out directly, but was there anybody that told you this is a dumb idea, this will never work? You said a lot of smart people heard the idea. Were there any points where you thought, wow, they've got a really good point, maybe this isn't a good idea? Or, or uh, were you just well, dedicated to the cause? I mean, plenty, plenty of people told us that who we really respect. Right. So mm -hmm. It's not like you they know, weren't mean about it. In fact, they they're trying to help. Right. right if you yeah. ask somebody's advice and they think you're about to drive your car over a cliff, you kind of hope that they're going to tell you, "Don't, don't. You need to turn left right now. Don't drive their car over the cliff." Um, so we had some people. They were very polite about it, but they were like, "Hey, I, you know, I, we didn't get anybody coming back and telling us that's technically not going to work." Mm -hmm. The pushback was always. Players are not going to buy that. I think you're taking a big risk. And we did uh, we did send out our pitch video to people, and that was interesting because the we definitely had some people tell us your videos it's not going to work. It's too long. It's not this. It's not that. I mean, we got I don't know 20 different people gave us 20 very different responses, you know, to that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was more than 20, but my <laughs> my point is every person had a very different opinion, and and a lot of them were not particularly flattering. Um, but you know, it does. At the end of the day, it's not like they all came back and agreed and said what you need to do is include this in your video. They were all different opinions, so we had to just kind of pick through and interpolate, interpolate, and say, okay, well, here's what we think the right answer is, and and then you do the best that you can. A lot of it, I think, that really was helpful was also we were very honest. We've been very upfront since the beginning. Like, here's who we are. Here's what we're trying to build. 
Uh, and even if you're not into it, that's totally cool. Thanks for looking. Because we knew going into this that some number of people were not going to like it. The question was, would enough people like it to give us liftoff? So, like I mentioned earlier, the advent of crowdfunding, a lot of people can design their own games at this point. Uh, I don't know how long any... I think between the three of us, I think there's over a century's worth of gaming experience, <laughs> if not more than that. Just Not just as a developer, but as a player as well. So, looking at the games that are getting released lately, and the state that they're, some of them are in lately, uh, but we're not going to name names because that's been beaten to death. Uh, do, you, do you think it's getting to the point where gamers are starting to look toward the more creative aspects, or they're looking toward, you know, they've been so tired of saying, well, this game is bad, this game is bad, well, we're going to just make our own. Do you think that's starting to happen now? Well, I think gamers are a very diverse bunch, mm -hmm. right? I don't think that we're one audience. I think that we're, you know, if there's a million gamers, there's probably a million point, 1.1 million actual ideas because some of them are bipolar. So, you know, it's just people have different ideas about how things should work. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of the audience is very sophisticated, like you say, and is looking for something different, mm -hmm. a lot different, and they may need to go make that themselves because it's not being satisfied. I think there's still a giant audience who will take whatever shows up, you know, on the marketplace and play it. And some, some of them are going to find it kind of it, it's the right thing for them. It's the right game for them. Even if we, you or I look at it, we go, oh, no, that, that game's no good. And I don't really want to run down anybody who has to, you know, the the furnace that fires, you know, that, that smelts down every game is pretty, it's pretty harsh, right? Mm -hmm. Getting games out at all is, is amazing. Getting yeah. ones out that are really awesome is even ten times more amazing. It's very difficult, the, the, the game-making process, it's very difficult to ship, like, a super high quality, you know, mostly bug free, really fun in every aspect game. It just mm -hmm. is. There's too many moving parts to really do that every single time. So I, I don't want to cast stones at any of our brethren because I know exactly what kind of crap they go through <laughs> to ship anything, much less something good. Yeah, and I, I, I what you said earlier, I, I think is kind of interesting is not only is Unity, you know, now, and I kind of brought brought it down to, to make it more accessible. Gamers are much more knowledgeable, like they've just gotten much more skilled in being able to dissect these things and try and pick them apart and figure out how they work. Uh, and, and there's a number of people, you know, like I, I, I'm like myself, quite frankly, who uh, we didn't come through any formalized design or game development process. Like when I was in college, there was no game design degree process, right? So I learned it primarily from working on it on my own with my friends in our respective, you know, dorm rooms. Uh, we ran MUDs for years and, you know, we learned to code, we learned community management, we learned design, we learned dealing with customer support, like we learned operations. We just kind of learned all of that stuff by doing it. And because there was nobody there to tell us, hey, don't try that, you're going to fail. You know, a lot of times we did fail, but it didn't matter. And a few times we surprised even ourselves and we actually succeeded. And that we just by doing it, you know, it's 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 just like anything else, right? Is is there's a traditional way to learn guitar by going to school and having somebody teach you guitar. And then there's also that I'm just gonna go in the basement and I'm gonna play this thing until my fingers bleed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, come out ten thousand hours later and you're pretty damn good at guitar. That's a completely valid way to go about it, and I bet there's a lot. I, I bet if you took a cross section of our industry and the people who, you know, have gotten in the position where they get to, you know, to, to take major roles on titles, I bet a lot of them are self-taught and came up that way. Um, so I think it's entirely valid. Are there, are there any aspects of Crowfall that you you really wanted to get, or any any part of the process? that you actually wanted in Crowfall, but for one reason or another, it, it couldn't work right now? Oh, there was a ton of those, actually. Yeah. And, and we just cleared with the two, hitting two million on our site. We just got to the biggest one that was outstanding, which was there was a whole other rule set that we mm -hmm. wanted called the Shadow. Yes. And it included the uh, uh, Bane Circle Siege mechanic, which is more similar to the one that we had on Shadowbane. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that I really wanted to have, but the numbers just didn't work. So... We had a handful of these that were things we really wanted, but oh well, we can't afford them. Let's make stretch goals out of them. And I'm glad we just covered that last one because that was a big one. 
So, t so tell us a little bit about that, that shadow mechanic. What, what exactly does it entail? Uh, well, th so you've got four bands. You've got, uh, and the, g the largest piece that separates the bands is how are the teams broken up, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the kind of the, the lightest two are God's Reach and Infected, which are basically pre-made factions. So you join a pre-existing team, and mm -hmm. that, you don't have complete control then over who you're going to be teamed up with. Um, the God's Reach is actually three factions, so Order, Chaos, Balance, and then the Infected is actually 12 factions. So you've got 12 gods, and four of them are Order, four are Chaos, four are Balance. The next two, Shadow and Dregs, we haven't been very specific in what the differences are, and for some, to some degree that's because we're still working that out, depending mm -hmm. on what we think is going to work. Um, but uh, those are the ones where you come in and they're more guild-focused. And the, the biggest differentiator there is we've decided that there's a line of at some point, we need to figure out exactly what is more hardcore than your general population is going to accept. We're going to throw that stuff into the dregs, and the rest will keep over in the shadow. So I know that's not a specific answer, but that's because I'm not ready to give a specific answer. <laughs> it's not like I haven't had people ask. <laughs> I, I, not you in particular, but on the floor, yeah. people are like, you haven't explained this. Yeah, I know. It's because I don't want to talk about it yet. I'll let you know <laughs> what it is. That's, that's fair. Uh, so obviously, there's going to be a lot of surprises. No matter what, there's going to be, there's never going to be a situation within reason that people are going to go into the game. It's going to be same old, same old. It's going to feel like a job, right? Oh yeah, I mean that's one thing we can guarantee is, is is the game is going to feel very different. It's going to be filled with those interesting moments that usually you only get, you know, one of those every couple hours worth of gameplay at the most, couple weeks, yeah. maybe once per the for the entire length of the game. Uh, but those are the moments we remember, right? Those interesting, weird, fluky things almost always revolve around emergent gameplay with other players. Mm -hmm. And later, I don't remember the 27th orc that I killed, but I do remember that one weird time, that one crazy guy ran in the middle of our party and kited some monster in and we all got wiped, you know? So, that it is, is griefing going to be something that everybody's going to be a little concerned about, or is it going to be something where... It's going to be fun no matter what, because I, I think MMOs do suffer a little bit from griefing. So I'm wondering how how is that going to happen in Crowfall? How's that going to work out? Well, back to back to the love child, you know, the unholy love child. I mean, um, in Eve, griefing is gameplay, mm -hmm. right? And exactly, we have that kind of harsh world. So for yeah. gameplay, you know, it's really you know buyer beware. Almost anything goes. It is. So we yeah. divide it. I mean, we put different layers in the pool, right? Here's mm -hmm. the here's the shallow end, and here's the deep end. And you get to kind of dial where you want to go in the pool. But if you go where the sharks are, don't get really annoyed and angry at us. If About you get the bit. Mark. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 you know that's the way it works. Yeah, so it's it's basically kind of like with the whole game design, as you were talking about, you kind of just jumped in with no real warning people are going to have that experience as well and they're going to have they're going to have fun either way from the sounds of it it depends uh, on where they go right i yeah. mean if, if you're really concerned about griefing then you can stay in the god's reach world right where it's, it's pre-made factions and mm -hmm. there's not friendly fire and you're going to have a much more controlled experience um and if you really just hate that completely you could play in your kingdom though you're going to have a limited gameplay experience there because at the end of the day we don't want people to just stay in their kingdom forever we, we actually want them to venture out and have to deal with other players. Whereas down in the dregs, I mean, people are going to be joining guilds under false pretenses, yeah. betrayal of trusts, backstabbing. You know, everything is going to be higher risk and higher reward. I am so going to be playing in nothing but the dregs, I swear. <laughs> All uh, right, so, cool. <laughs> so I think this is the last question about the, the actual development or design or whatnot. Well, maybe not the last question, but... Were there any points, because you're working with voxels, and because it's so difficult, and because it, it radically changes the landscape, were there any particular glitches? Because I'm a big fan of glitches. I love glitches. I If I buy a game and I hear, oh, there's so many glitches, I want to see them all. So were there any particularly nasty bugs, or funny bugs for that matter, uh, in part of the process? That you just well, wanted to leave we'll in, maybe? It's funny now, as we probably used to. Um, uh, like, this, we put out a, Vintar, a video recently with the Centaur, mm -hmm. where um, there was, it was actually a pretty funny video. If you haven't seen it, you should go check it out. But mm -hmm. we, took, uh, we constantly cut footage in the game, and at one point, 
the centaur characters were just going crazy. Like they were galloping through the sky and their blades were going, duck, 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 you know, across the screen. Uh, it looked absolutely ridiculous. And that's the kind of footage that normally you throw away or delete. In mm -hmm. this case, included some of that in that video. So if you want to go and check that out. But most of the bugs we're seeing right now are pretty, they're not funny. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. we tried to do this and the entire server crash. Like we're still, you know, we're still in open heart server surgery. So um, the, the kind of more funny, everything is mostly working except for this one weird tweak stuff. That's going to come later down the pipe. I think. I mean, have you seen anything? No. I mean, they're just irritating for us, yeah. right? We're trying sure. to make some more, uh, you know, the ones that are funny are when you get unexpected circumstances in a real life environment. It, it, to to players, they see glitches and they see bugs and they see one group will see, hey, this is really funny. This is you know, like a blooper reel almost. And then you'll have another quadrant that are like, well, this this game is crap. This this is terrible. And and yet, from the developer standpoint, are, are there ever any actually other than the Centaur one, which I need to watch now? Uh, are there any that you just l sit back and go? That's like 20, 30 hours of my life gone, and that's the result, but that is kind of funny. Or is it, or is a glitch always, I need to fix that? Is it always that thing that makes you clench your teeth? Well, I think, you know, when I think about the live games I've run, typically mm -hmm. you don't want to destroy people's experience. Mm -hmm. and, and like you say, for one person it's amusing, for other people it's literally, uh, you know, rage quit. Mm. Kind of stuff. So you know, when you run a service, you're always trying to keep people from rage quitting. You know, because you you end up getting divorced from most MMOs, right? You don't mm -hmm. you don't like leave them on good terms and come back again, do a sleepover, you know, leave for a while again, and come back. There's a few MMOs that have done that. WoW being one of the most successful at that. Uh, I think of City of Heroes as being one that you can kind of leave on good terms with and come back to. But most MMOs, if you think about your experience, you end up divorcing them. You, you have that moment where you go, love switches to hate, and then you're gone. And unfortunately, big, you know, glitches, as you call them, or bugs, yeah. you know, they really yeah. destroy the player's experience, or divorce moments. Yeah. They're the last straw, you know, on the camel's back. So that's, that's how I look at them. Mostly. Yeah, th okay. I mean, there's, there's kind of two different mentalities, too, right? One is, is uh, you know, and it's, it's more of the we have funding and let's go build this thing and we're going to wait until the last moment and it's going to be perfectly polished hopefully and then launch it right we've taken the very different approach we're going to be letting people in into the kitchen while we're in the middle of cooking stuff and we're going to let, let them taste some of the ingredients i mean so um you know with our players in particular i would absolutely suggest like be ready to see some stuff that's not done and if you aren't, then go away and come back. <laughs> come back later when the game is done, because that's the price you pay when you walk back into the kitchen, right? Um, yeah. You know, if you want to see how the sausage is made, it's sometimes ugly. That's just the way it works. I totally understandable. And one of the things that I also like about about Crowfall, actually, just the social team. I love the fact that you guys send out emails every couple of days, every week or so, and it just details not just footage, but it also shows you know concept art. And that centaur video, which I'm digging through my inbox now, and I'm seeing gets yeah, there. I, that's that's not the kind of connection that people are used to seeing from a developer, or or they're used to seeing it. But it's it's one of those things where you usually don't see that until it's fully released. Uh, is that just because you've got the the two alpha, two beta events, or is that something that's going to be constant throughout all of oh, our crafts? It's going to be constant. It's constant. Yeah. And, and, you know, it was a choice from the very beginning. So the easy thing for us to do would be, hey, we got your money, now we're going to go dark and go build some stuff, right? Yeah. But the moment that we launch the Kickstarter camp, really, the moment we launch the teaser the, the site, teaser really. site mm -hmm. we thought of ourselves as being live. Mm -hmm. We're already live. We're already in the process of entertaining and engaging people. Well, we have customers. We've we collected not. their money, right? They're yeah. waiting on the entree. So we're trying to feed them appetizers to keep them all fed and happy while we go cook the food. I mean, that we look at it as a live project. You know, we look at it as we're already live, and, and we need to we need to be respectful and we need to be entertaining. So and it's hard to you know to come up with the content every week, you know, because the dev cycle is 
kind of not regular. You know, there's stuff that takes longer than others. So lining up something to talk about every week sometimes is challenging. Sometimes we have a lot to talk about and we have to kind of space that out. But a lot of times we're going, wow, we're a little short. What can we what can we add right now that will make sense and and help people understand where we are with the game? So, the, you know, there was a time going into our teaser campaign. Oh, yeah, we've got all this stuff lined up. We know exactly what we're going to do. And we burned through that stuff about 30 percent faster than we thought we would because people wanted more. And you want to give people what they want. So in regards to giving people more, because, of course, we've already touched on how it's going to follow a kind of a, a Guild Wars mentality where once you buy the game, that's it. You have it forever until the game you know, shuts down, which I hope does not happen for a very, very long time, if ever. So what is your opinion on the microtransaction aspect? Is that something that we're going to see a lot in uh, Crowfall? Or is that going to be just for certain points? I know there are technically... Technically, you could say that for your pledge, you get the game and a bunch of other stuff, but will we see anything like that in the game proper? Will there be like an in-game store or anything like that? So, yeah, there are, and there is a store, actually, but but the things okay. that we're selling, we've been very clear on dividing the line of what we're willing to sell and what we're not. Now, of the things that we're willing to sell, we're going to fill that catalog out, right? Like, for, you know, we don't, we don't sell castles in the campaign worlds because that would affect who wins the campaigns mm -hmm. but we also have these other worlds that are eternal kingdoms that players can hang out in and they're social hubs they can do some economy game there and they can do some crafting there and stuff like that yeah we sell castles there we gave them out in kickstarter we also sell them on our site uh the way we look at it is it doesn't affect the overall balance of the game it doesn't affect who wins in the campaigns because the campaigns have import and export rules anyway mm -hmm. um and uh and they they're not they're, you know, they're cool social mechanics, like I can say, hey, look at this big castle that I have, but it's not affecting my ability to win the campaign or eventually the tournaments anyway. So if we can sell some of those right now and use that to augment our budget and make a better game that everyone gets to enjoy, we're going to do that. So um, if you go up there, you can actually see the things that, that we're selling. And I'm sure we'll come up with a few more, but that's our dividing line is is we're, we're being very, very careful that we don't... Uh, allow the impurity of us uh, selling stuff to uh, affect the balance of the campaign worlds themselves. Yeah, the, where the competition is, that there needs to be a level playing field. Yeah, exactly. That's fair, that's fair. So, I think that pretty much... Hmm. Are, are there any other things that you want to add about the mechanics that, you know, this is a, a game that defies, defies categorization. There, there's really no way that we can say, yeah, it's like this, but it's a little this, it's a little this. Uh, if if you could possibly come up with a, a term that kind of encapsulates everything of profile, you said throne throne war simulator. Yeah, that's what that's what we called it so far, throne war simulator. Mm -hmm. And if we come up with something better, we certainly will use it. <laughs> but the, the, to me, the game kind of exists on three fundamental levels, which is is you know military might, economic wealth, and political uh, manipulation. That's that's kind of the three major areas that I think we're going to pass. And and all of the features that we have, therefore should be feeding into one or more of those. So I, I think, you know, if you if you asked me to summarize it, I'd say that would be my three primary pillars of, of what we're going for. So it is a song of ice and fire translated to computer in, I into a PC game. I have to legally comment on that, but I have read <laughs> that and it's great. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so I think that pretty much does it. Are there are there any final thoughts that you want to add to the people that are watching or anything that you feel that we need to touch on? Well, I think that, you know, what I want to say is I, I think we're both blown away by the number of people who kind of got what we were trying to do yeah. and were willing to pre, you know, pre-order it so far in advance. So that's, to, for us, that was the validator to say, okay, we, we're probably crazy. We know that. <laughs> but there's other people who are as crazy as we are. And so mm -hmm. that was really, you know, I want to thank every backer we've had because Absolutely. We, right. we couldn't build a game without them. We are building the game for them, and we're building for all the people behind them who are not the risk takers who will back a game this early, right? Because we feel like that less than 10% of the entire market has even heard the game, the name Crowfall yet, right? Mm -hmm. And that most of the people who are, have even looked at us have not said, oh, yeah, I hate those guys. They've just said, I want to wait until it's more real, and that's a perfectly valid place to be. 
we just appreciate the people who are bigger risk takers than that and are on this ride. With us. I, yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate even the people who ultimately decide not to back us and say that the game's not for me because they still gave us their attention and that certainly is valuable. Mm -hmm. But you're right, we wouldn't be in the position if it wasn't for other people. And it is a, I mean, it is a roll of the dice. It always is, right? Every game development, every large endeavor like this is always a roll of the dice. And in this case, people were willing to say, well, if you guys are willing to put in your own money and your own careers on the line and your own time and your own everything, which we are. I mean, we're you know we're all in. Um, they were willing to say, okay, cool. Then I'm I'm willing to give you some additional uh, funds to try and make that dream come true. And that's awesome. That's amazing. So when is the next major event? Uh, there's there's alphas and betas as we've already discussed. And for certain pledge tiers, uh, you have access to those. So when is the next major event going to occur? Yeah. The, the well, the first one where other people will get in and play the game is at the end of summer. That's the first external testing we'll have, and that's the combat milestone. Okay. And when, best guesstimate, when do you think there will be a final release? Well, as an MMO, there's never truly a final release, but, but all the pieces that we want to pull together that we talked about during Kickstarter, mm -hmm. we're looking at end of next year. Okay. Uh, next year, quarter one, quarter two? No, the, end end, of, the end of next the year. End of next year, quarter four? Okay. Year. Awesome. Sounds wonderful. So, yeah, but, but what you'll see between now and then is you'll basically see things move forward, things push out, things will jockey for position, we'll change priorities. I mean, we're, we're really treating it as, we're treating it like it's a live service now, and that's the way you do it with live service We'll be launching well. pieces, and then we'll be starting to launch the pieces put together. Yep. Sounds good, sounds good. So anyway, to, to wrap things up, thank you both for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Very, very, very appreciated. The game, in case nobody has actually been paying attention, is called Crowfall. You can find out more about it at crowfall.com. And honestly, thank you folks for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very thank you. much.